Good morning, uh, Mark, Paul, uh, uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first and foremost, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, this is your first Powell breakfast of the year, uh, and so it's a particular privilege to, to be asked to come. What I'm going to try to do this morning is to start by setting out a narrative which I hope will support the thesis that we are beginning to see steady improvement in the economy. It's probably no more than green shoots, but certainly there seem to be indications that we're going in the right direction. And then to address the question as to what we need to do to consolidate what we have achieved and then to build upon it. So that's the kind of framework I'd like to uh, frame uh, my remarks around. So why do I say that we are beginning to see uh, progress in the right direction? As you all know, the main source of instability in the system uh, has been the fiscal operations of the government. This has been so for several decades, from the time the economy was liberalized in 1977. I think you're, those of you who heard me before are probably sick of hearing this, but that, that is really the main source of instability in the system, and we are beginning to see material improvement. Um, as you know, the government has embarked upon a revenue enhancement-based uh, fiscal consolidation program. And for the first time since 1953, there was, right, there was a primary surplus, uh, or just about, uh, minute, okay, all, almost, we almost achieved a primary surplus uh, last year, and the um, uh, expectation is that there will be a surplus in the current account of the budget for the first time since 1987 this year. These are structural improvements in the budget, and I think we must also recognize the fact that there were two landmark reforms. One was the uh, VAT reform, and the other the Inland Revenue, uh, the new Inland Revenue Act. In this country, we kind of tend to measure development either in terms of kilometers of tarmac rolled out or bricks and mortar that is built. We don't really uh, pay enough attention to improvements in the, in the overall framework of the economy. In terms of the policy framework, we often don't pay enough attention. So these two measures, the VAT uh, reform and the New Inland Revenue Act, in my view, are landmark reforms which will address as I said, uh, what has been the main source of instability in the, in, the, in the system. And we are beginning to see results. So, and as you know, the government has uh, a fiscal consolidation trajectory embedded in the extended fund facility of the IMF. Uh, and the expectation is that we still can reach the 3.5% target for 2020. So that's on the fiscal side. On the monetary policy side, uh, we are beginning to see the transmission of the tightening cycle that began uh, at the beginning of 2016. Both uh, monetary expansion and credit growth have been trending down in recent months to levels that the central bank is comfortable with. Inflation, there is a mixed narrative, but from a monetary policy perspective, i.e. in terms of what the central bank can, con can control, co-inflation has been well within the target. In fact, I think last month it was 2.8%. Our target is actually 4 to 6, so it's a bit under the target. But the problem has been headline inflation. Headline inflation actually crept up above 8%, but it has been trending down in the last couple of months, as we expected it to. The causal factor, as you all know, has been the supply disruption to agricultural production uh, due to three consecutive uh, seasons, uh, agricultural seasons being affected by drought, and of course, the floods also uh, had an impact. So the supply disruption, in fact, food price inflation went up over 13% a few months ago when headline inflation peaked. It's on its way down, 
and we are beginning to see headline inflation also trend down. And it was really two items. It was rice and coconuts, which drove the food price inflation. And there was a pickup in vegetable prices in December as well. But we are beginning to see all that now subside. Um, so as I said, co-inflation is well within target, and we see headline inflation coming down. And our expectation is that um, um, headline inflation should also come within the 4 to 6 percent target by the uh, end of the first quarter. Um, in terms of the monetary policy stance, um, as you know, growth has been muted. This year, we are likely to end up with growth a shade under 4 percent. Uh, in the central bank's view, the potential growth rate is about 5.75 percent. So with this output gap, one would normally uh, want to consider whether one should end this tightening cycle and move to a more relaxed monetary policy stance. However, the fact that headline inflation has been above the target uh, has meant that the monetary board has uh, taken the view that we need to be very cautious about anchoring inflation expectations and ensuring that there aren't second round demand side effects, particularly through wages, that could feed into uh, inflationary pressure. Because of that, the, uh, the monetary policy stance remains unchanged. Uh, clearly, if inflation keeps trending down, then one would need to see uh, whether one could have more growth supportive uh, uh, monetary policy. But the monetary board will be very much data driven. Uh, uh, in terms of how monetary policy is framed moving forward. So fiscal outlook has improved, uh, monetary uh, aggregates are trending down, inflation, core inflation is within target, and headline inflation is coming down. And on the exchange rate, I remember at the beginning of last year, at the beginning of 2017, people asking me whether it's going to be 158, or is it going to be 160 uh, to the dollar? Uh, we ended up a shade under 154. So there has been a reasonable amount of stability as far as the exchange rate is concerned. Uh, despite the fact that the central bank has not intervened to support the rupee uh, since about March, April of last year, we have entered the market to purchase dollars to build up non-debt creating reserves, but we haven't sold dollars to support the rupee now for eight, nine months. So that's another favorable development. We have, we've delivered a more competitive exchange rate, uh, but with that increased competitiveness, there has been a degree of stability, which has been welcome as well. And if you look at international reserves, we started 2017 with six billion US dollars, and it dipped down to five billion in March, April, because there was a large outflow of um, dollars from the government securities market as one large player unwound uh, its position. Um, um, so it dipped to five, and then it ended up the year uh, at about 7.95 billion. We are down to about 7.5 billion now, because we've had to make a large Asian Clearing Union payment. Uh, so we feel that uh, um, we're in you know, reasonable shape. But going forward, in the next year or two, we need to have a reserve build up to meet the debt, external debt obligations that are going to start bunching up from 2019 onwards. And we're reasonably confident that we can get I hope the Director of International Operations will agree with me here. I can see him in the audience. We're reasonably confident that we can get to 9.5, possibly even 10 billion this year. Why do I say that? Uh, we've, um, we're planning to issue an international sovereign bond uh, um, within, within uh, the next few weeks. Uh, the, the, the government has given us authority to raise up to 2 billion US dollars. Um, there's also authority to, to raise 
3 billion by way of Sri Lanka development bonds, but that, there's a rollover of 2.5 billion, so the incremental amount is about 500 million there. And in the last eight, nine months of 2017, we were purchasing on average about 200 million US dollars a month from the market. So that gives you another 2.4 billion, but even if one assumes that we say purchase only about 100, 100 150 million, uh, that still gives you about 1.8 billion uh, dollars worth of non-debt creating reserves coming in. In addition, we have received 300 million uh, of the 1.1 billion for the Hambantota long lease. So there's uh, another 800 million which will come in this year. Some money has also come in uh, just last week, but altogether there is about 800 million of non-debt creating money. So if we can raise 1.8 billion direct purchases, 800 million from Hamantota, on top of that, the government is planning to divest some other assets. Uh, you know, they, they've mentioned uh, the Hyatt and Hilton and possibly some other assets as well. So all that means that we, we feel reasonably confident um, that we can get reserves up to 9.5 to 10 billion uh, at, by the end of this year. And if you look at the, um, the real sector, as I said, gro overall growth is disappointing. But again, there are some good, um, there is good news embedded in the overall growth story. One is that exports have picked up. Uh, since March, April of last year, we've seen uh, positive export growth. And the last three, four months, we've seen exports reach uh, a billion uh, uh, dollars a month. And the expectation is that we ended last year with record exports with goods of 1.4 billion US dollars and services of 3.6. So for the $15 billion uh, worth of exports of goods and services is a record. Uh, but um, I must be careful what I say because people put headlines on these things, but I feel, I feel that this is not enough. Um, clearly we're coming off a very low base. So it's nothing that we, uh, we can be complacent about, but the direct sort of direction of travel is positive. And the expectation is as we'll have a whole year of GSP plus this year, uh, and, and there are tailwinds in the, in the, in the global uh, economy, particularly our main markets in the US and Europe. So given all that, I think we can be reasonably confident that this upward trend in exports will gather momentum. And even industrial production, of course it's related to export performance, we've seen a pickup in that. So these are all kind of positive signs as far as the economy is concerned, both in terms of the macroeconomic fundamentals uh, as well as the real economy. But as I said, these are still really only green shoots. We need to build on it. And what do we need to do first to make sure that we consolidate? One is to persist with fiscal consolidation. We need to stick, my friend Mr. Atigalesia, he, he will be under a lot of pressure, I'm sure, but we need to stick at it. We need to stick at the fiscal consolidation. That is the f most important thing that we need to do. On the central bank side, we need to make sure that we stay away from fiscal forbearance and monetizing the deficit if that pressure comes on. So fiscal dominance has characterized monetary policy for years and years in this country. We need to have a clean break from the past as far as monetary policy uh, setting is concerned. Uh, and we need to maintain a competitive exchange rate. You know, one, I think, the fact that's not recognized sufficiently is what happened uh, to the tradable goods sector from over the last 15 years. Exports, I mean, the tradable goods sector was about 80% of GDP. It came down to 45. In the period sort of 24, 20045 20, to 2015, we saw um, tradables come down. Within that, exports, which were 33% of GDP in 2000, 27% in 2004-05, came down to 12%. At the same time, foreign commercial borrowing shot up. 
I think from about 3% of GDP to 13% of GDP. So if you have a policy framework which leads to a nosedive in your exports and your tradables, and at the same time you, you go to the markets and, and borrow uh, uh, in the way that we did, clearly that, that's really a suicidal path. So that we have to have a clean break from that, and it's encouraging that we are beginning to see export growth, tradable goods growth, and we need to ensure that we continue with that, and a competitive exchange rate is a sine qua non for that. Okay, so those are the three things which I think we need to do to consolidate. That is, fiscal consolidation, ensure monetary policy is not affected by fiscal dominance, and deliver a competitive exchange rate. Now, what do we need to do to build on these green shoots? Or what do we need to do to keep the analogy consistent? What do we need to do to fertilize and nurture uh, the green, green shoots? Um, first, let me talk about the macro fundamentals. Um, many of you probably have already heard me say this, but uh, there are four frameworks that are being put in place to bring about greater stability and predictability as far as macroeconomic policy making is concerned. First, as I said, is the fiscal consolidation that's taking place. And the idea is not only to introduce these frameworks, but to institutionalize them. And the government is seriously considering institutionalizing its, its commitment to fiscal consolidation by strengthening the Fiscal Responsibility Management Act. We've had a Fiscal Responsibility Management Act since 2003, I think, three or four, uh, but almost in every year we've breached the targets. Now the idea is to fix the targets and to also specify particular reasons why you would be permitted to exceed the targets. It could be something like an exogenous shock which leads to a deep, deep recession, and then the government will need to take expansionary, counter-cyclical fiscal policies for recovery from a deep recession. Or it could be uh, you know, a natural disaster and you need to spend a lot of money uh, or, or climate-affected uh, uh, relief where you need to spend a lot of money. But if you do, then the government should be required to specify how they're going to come back, the path for returning to the, uh, the, the, within the target. So that's something we are encouraging the government to, to adopt, to have these clear fiscal rules and have them institutionalized. On, on, the, on the monetary policy side, the central bank is trying to institutionalize uh, a flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, we've strengthened our, our forecasting and modeling capacity. And the idea is to have very much a data-driven, forward-looking, proactive monetary policy. Uh, if you, I'm not, I won't, because of the shortage of time, I won't go into any great detail, but the central bank's roadmap, which is on the central bank website, deals in detail with what uh, the roadmap in terms of introducing a flexible inflation targeting regime. And, and again, the idea is to institutionalize it by amending the Monetary Law Act, uh, and so that there is a strong legal framework and an accountability framework which would support the flexible inflation targeting regime. Uh, and a couple of key pillars for a successful uh, uh, inflation, a flexible inflation targeting regime are one, central bank autonomy, and two, very robust and good fiscal monetary coordination. Um, on the exchange rate, so those are two frameworks. The third framework relates to the exchange rate, and there we are getting some very good technical assistance from the IMF to put in place certain parameters within which we would manage the exchange rate so that there would be greater predictability and, and uh, uh, consistency. I mean, this is, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Many countries have these parameters. We just need to customize those parameters uh, to our uh, local circumstances. And the measures are also being taken to develop the FX market. The fourth framework relates to liability management. 
As you know, this year we have a big peak in terms of domestic debt repayments. And the idea is to manage that. We were fortuitous. You know, some years ago there was a World Bank, senior World Bank vice president who said God is a Sri Lankan, and, and he may be right, because just when we seem to be going over the cliff, somehow we get something which, uh, which keeps us uh, <laughs> on the right side. Uh, here, um, fortuitously, there were no domestic debt maturities in there, at least bond maturities, in the last five months of 2017. So that has given us the opportunity to mobilize a buffer. So we've raised about 110 billion rupees, which will enable us to manage the peak in the domestic debt repayments. There are about seven big days, and my colleagues have worked out a strategy with the with their counterparts in the finance ministry, and we are pretty confident that we can manage it. Uh, foreign debt, um, there is a bunching. I think everybody in the room knows that. There is a bunching of external debt obligations from 2019 through to 2022. And again, what we are creating now is a framework to enable us to build up a buffer. And how we are doing that is by introducing the Liability Management Act. The bill has now been submitted to Parliament. I hope in a matter of weeks it will be enacted. And what it does is this. At the moment, the Appropriation Act limits government borrowing to the government's borrowing requirement in any particular year. So you can't borrow extra money to build buffers. Now, what this Liability Management Act does is it enables uh, the additional headroom to borrow for liability management, but again, within very strict rules. I mean, they're not, it's not opening the floodgates for the government to borrow as it wants, but again, for specific purposes and with a limit. And that would enable uh, uh, us to build a buffer. Uh, so what we will do uh, is to use the Liability Management Act to go to the market to raise money above the government's borrowing requirement which would then enable us, and fortunately, again, we have, <laughs> we have no major uh, sovereign bond maturity this year, which gives us the time to build this buffer. So, you know, maybe God is Sri Lankan after all. We keep getting this opportunity to, to get out of our out of big holes. So, uh, uh, um, so the idea is now to, again, build a buffer which will enable us to do switching, buybacks, pre-financing, look at various options to see how we can extend the maturities, to extend the tenors uh, of our uh, foreign debt, and if possible also to drive down the cost. And one thing I'd like to observe at this point is that there's clearly we need to be cognizant of the fact uh, that the risk-free rates, the U.S. dollar treasury uh, uh, um, rates are going up, and the, the, the Fed is expected to, to tighten two, definitely, probably three seems to be the consensus this year. Now, um, so how do we address that? What we are trying to do is to really reduce the risk premium above the risk-free rate through having much more robust macroeconomic fundamentals. Now, the, the ISB, the, the international sovereign bond that was issued at 6 point, 620 basis points uh, last May has been trading around 550, 560, about 60, 70 basis points tighter. So uh, we heard from the, the standard chartered research team that they expect a 65%, 65 basis point increase uh, in the risk-free rate, in the U.S. Treasury rates. So, if that is the case, and we can keep, uh, keep costs, keep the, the, keep the secondary uh, uh, market trading um, uh, in our uh, issuances tighter by 60-70%, clearly then there shouldn't be any increase in our borrowing costs. So that makes it even more important that we maintain sound macroeconomic fundamentals. Because clearly interest rates are going to tighten. Uh, uh, the U.S. is on a tightening cycle. The ECB has started uh, uh, moving into a, a tightening cycle. So how we need to compensate, to mitigate that, is by reducing the risk premium 
attached to our paper by improving our economic fundamentals. Let me um, quickly, uh, no more than five minutes, I hope, uh, the, the, um, talk a little bit about growth. You know, I know this year we're probably going to end up a shade under four, but much of it has been due to weather-related supply disruption. Uh, um, so what, what can we do to strengthen the growth framework? Uh, taking a more medium-term view, um, and here there are positive developments uh, to share with you again. One is, in my view, we are moving into a period of significantly greater policy coherence. Uh, last year, if you look at the Vision 2025 document, the Prime Minister's economic statement and the budget, there is much better alignment in terms of the policy framework embedded in these documents. So this, in my, again, as I say in my view, uh, provides uh, the, the framework for far more consistent and predictable policy making uh, than we've had uh, in recent years. So that's a significant improvement in my view. I think you will see much better policy coherence uh, with greater predictability and consistency. Secondly, the investment climate. Uh, as you know, the government launched a major program in May of last year uh, to improve the investment climate. They had task forces working on eight of the 10 or 12 pillars of the Doing Business Index, uh, and uh, the, 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 these action plans are now being rolled out. And hopefully we will see a material impact in the months ahead. Anyway, it's, it was, I, don't, I, I, st we, I still haven't been able to check, but there was a press item that our ranking was actually 89 uh, rather than 111. Uh, clearly, th that's better news, but still not good enough. So we need to keep pressing on as far as investment climate is concerned. And on investment promotion, the BOI is focusing its, its, its uh, campaigns. Uh, they've identified certain uh, potential uh, sectors which have uh, a comparative advantage, and they want to target anchor investors uh, within those sectors. So hopefully we're going to see a more focused uh, BOI operation and also a, a, a greater um, uh, facilitation as far as investors are concerned, or better facilitation. Trade policy, I think this in some ways may be the jewel in the crown as far as the government's policies are concerned. One is I think it's a good thing to read the government's trade policy statement. It's a very concise, clear document. It gives you what the government is trying to do. In addition, there is the anti-dumping bill, which is now going through. Secondly, uh, thirdly, there is the trade adjustment package to provide support to um, enterprises and workers who are affected by any liberalization that takes place through uh, the uh, trade uh, agreements that are being negotiated. And fourthly, uh, the systematic removal of paratariffs. The government has committed itself to removing paratariffs. Our effective protection almost doubled uh, over the last 10, 15 years because of the various paratariffs uh, that were introduced. Um, and, and what that has done is it has basically cut us out of the global and regional supply chain narrative. I think only about 7% of our exports are part of uh, cross-border um, uh, production sharing networks, whereas over 50% of global trade actually is conducted or is, uh, takes place through uh, these uh, international uh, production sharing networks. Because in, in the modern uh, trading environment, the distinction between exports and imports are getting increasingly blurred. If you are to participate in these uh, cross-border production sharing networks, you have to be able to import and get it out quickly. So you're putting, you import, you put in your little value addition and you get it out. If you stick paratariffs in the way, you don't get into the supply chain. And that's exactly what we did. And therefore, we have not been able to participate in the most dynamic component of the international trading system. So if the government can persist and take away these paratariffs, clearly that opens up a whole new area 
in terms of opportunity for Sri Lankan enterprises. Then finally, um, these mega development projects in terms of the growth story, th this is probably more a medium term uh, 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 impact, but the Western Region Megapolis uh, project, the port city with the International Financial Center, the Hammanth of the development, the Trinko development, Kanti development, Kanti development and number of industrial zones uh, in other areas, all these things are in the pipeline uh, and they're moving forward. Ideally, they should move forward faster, but they, they are moving forward. Um, and as I said also, uh, there are tailwinds in the international economy. Our two key markets, the US, existing key markets, uh, the US and Europe are doing better. Uh, and uh, as I said, the way to, to mitigate the effects of normalization of international interest rates is to improve our macroeconomic fundamentals sufficiently to offset the impact of the increase in those rates. So now I'm going to stick my neck out. I was told this, I have to give an outlook, right? So let me, let me give you some numbers. And uh, if, if, uh, if they go way off, then I must remember not to accept if I'm invited next year. But, but uh, growth, we reckon, uh, in the central bank this year is likely to be between 5 and 5.5%. Um, inflation, as I said, we expect it to come down within the 4 to 6% range. Uh, by the end of the first quarter. I should say one other thing. An important structural reform, uh, which I forgot, which I should have mentioned in relation to the fiscal side of things, uh, is the inter and, an improvement in the operations of state-owned enterprises, is the government's commitment to introduce a automatic cost-reflective pricing mechanism for fuel and electricity. That is a major advance. Now, they're expected to uh, introduce the fuel uh, formula 31st March. And my colleagues in the central bank have done an exercise. If prices are in the 60 to 65, 60 to 65 dollar per barrel range, there will be almost no impact. Uh, because the pr current pricing formula assumes, I think, a 62, 62 dollar. Uh, 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 price, so I don't see any significant impact uh, as far as, uh, if, if, as long as prices remain in the 60-65 range. And that, I think, uh, uh, is, in my view, a likely outcome, though with prices are a little higher at the moment. Uh, but, you know, with U.S. shale production now being the key uh, swing uh, 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 factor in the oil market, uh, I think hopefully we can keep uh, the world price will be in the kind of $60, $65 range, and that means there shouldn't be too much of an impact. Uh, so growth 5 to 5.5%, 5 inflation within the 4 to 6% range. The current account deficit, we anticipate, uh, it will come down from 2.9% uh, in uh, 2017 uh, to 2.3% 2 because the deficit last year was affected by higher oil imports and higher rice imports uh, because of the, uh, the, the supply disruption due to the climate. Uh, if that normalizes, uh, we see, we see uh, the current account deficit come down to 2.3%. Even if oil prices do go up somewhat, uh, the volume of oil we would need to, to import this year uh, should come down and uh, mitigate that. International reserves, as I said, Hopefully we can get to US dollars 9.5 to 10 billion. Uh, and the budget deficit, I think the target is 4.7% or is it 4.8? 4.8% of GDP uh, uh, for this year. So those are the numbers. As I said, there are discernible green shoots, but they're still green shoots. So we need to persist to make sure that our macro policies are sound and we need to gather more momentum in terms of the structural reforms. We can't really go for growth artificially through loosening um, macroeconomic policies inappropriately. We have to drive higher growth, higher employment, higher incomes uh, through economic reforms. So we need to maintain the momentum. Thank you.